Great. Thank you uh, for being here. We'll be talking about renormalized volume in the context of uh, hyperbolic free manifold, which has been the main topic of my dissertation. So let me first start by telling you which are the type of objects and structure I will be caring about. Uh, I will be interested in the interior of some compact uh, three manifold with boundary. I will consider for technical simpler to keep it simple that all my boundary components have genus greater than or equal than two, that the boundary is incompressible, meaning if a curve from the boundary was trivial in, in the whole object, it will be trivial within the surface to begin with. And I will be interested in complete hyperbolic metrics in this subject up to uh, isotopy. And more than just any complete hyperbolic metric, I will be interested in the one for which the following is true. Uh, we should be able to find a subset N whose boundary is going to be convex and whose inclusion is isotopic to the full thing. Okay, this might seem to be a little bit too arbitrary, but once you consider these conditions, uh, almost every metric looks like this one. These are just an up and then set in the type of metric we will be interested. So now for this type of objects, uh, the volume of the whole manifold is going to be infinite. So we wish to calculate volume that uh, we run into a problem. And the idea of renormalization is try to rescue a finite number out of this. So how do we do this? Uh, let me start you know, again by my convex set and if I start looking to this, uh, to larger, larger balls from this set, namely NT, well, but all what I just said, you should be convinced that this quantity is going to infinity with T. Uh, the idea of renormalization is to understand how an asymptotic of this uh, function is, as it blows up. And then for us to be able to take a limit as T goes to infinity, and for this to be certain number which is now going to be finite. Uh, there are a lot of choices because I have not tell you how to take neither the function, neither this convex set. But assuming that we can do that uh, in a well-defined way, we'll rescue this number. And now the question is, how much of volume, how much of geometry does this number still remember? Or, is, or how much is this number still tied to those notions? So let me tell you right away how to do it. So it's mainly it's Sorry, that's what I'm about to tell you right now for this particular case. So for this particular case, uh, I start with the volume. I'm going to subtract 1 half of the integral of the mean curvature in the boundary of nt. And then I'm going to add this correction term with this is the characteristic of your, the only characteristic of your boundary. And the result is that this quantity does not uh, depend on t. And of course, the proof is you're going to be derivating on t and finding that the result is going to be 0. So observe that as you start taking larger and larger t, if you start seeing what's happening with the metric on your boundary, that metric is going to start blowing up exponentially. And so does the volume. Well, the same is going to be true about the mean curvature. So this is taking already care of that exponential behavior. And then you're left just with that linear term that's a little bit more easy to deal with. So you can name this as some notion of volume associated to the whole equidistant family. And this is completely well-defined uh, because that's not depend on t. But you could define it as the first finite term, so to speak. Of course, yeah. Yeah, that's it. There are a couple more ways to define this quantity. But yes, you're totally correct. Uh, well, when doing this, I still have not said what is the uh, canonic way, because uh, we can have this equation family in infinitely many ways. Well, let me denote by this just a metric restricted to the boundary of nt. And what I have been repeating so far is that this metric is blowing up exponentially. And what actually happens as t goes to infinity, you can actually take out this limit. Uh, this is going to be a well-defined symmetric to tensor. Uh, <coughs> regardless of your metric blowing up exponentially, if you stop caring about lens and you just focus on how to measure angles or you conform more structure, that's actually going to converge. 
The whole reason for that is because of infinity, we have a well-defined conformal structure that you should be converging with. So in a sense, your equidistant family, what is it doing? is singling out a symmetric to tensor that is compatible with the conformal structure you had at infinity once you had fixed your metric in N. So what is a good way of selecting a <coughs> a metric in a given conformal class where we can just take the metric with constant curvature. In this case, it's going to be uh, the hyperbolic metric. If we were going to do the variation of this quantity, we will obtain the following formula. And I will not focus on how to obtain, or how to precisely define all the terms I'm writing in the board right now. But let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, more than even more a conformal structure at the infinity, you have a projective structure. Uh, if you develop a projective structure in the sphere, uh, this quadratic differential norm known as a Schwarzschild that's just measuring how, that, how much different is this domain from an honest uh, ball. Uh, this is just taking the real part of this quadratic holomorphic differential. And this is a vector that lives in the same uh, tangent space. So the formula gives you a nice uh, way to calculate the variation and also gives you a nice characterization of what should be a critical point for this function. Moreover, this variation happens to coincide with the variation of a Liouville action in the boundary of your manifold. So you can, if you were not satisfied by just picking the hyperbolic metric among all your options in your conformal class, you could understand that you were solving a variational problem uh, of the Liouville action. But let me for now just uh, define it as that. So let me now tell you a couple of properties of this quantity that we just defined. This is myself, 2015. And for this, I will add that M needs to be a cylindrical. There needs, I'm assuming that there are not trivial, uh, the no existence of uh, non trivial cylinders in my manifold. This is just a technical definition. And all this computation, only at the critical point, if I will, were to calculate the Hessian, is given by the following formula. Where again, V and W are going to be uh, real part of quadratic holomorphic differentials. And here, this sigma is the derivative of the skinning map. Again, I don't have uh, enough time to tell you what's precisely the skinning map. But I will tell you that for this particular case, it was known that this quantity was a contraction uh, in the particular case of the cylindrical case. So what this will tell you is uh, all the critical points are going to be strict local minimums. Why this tie is interesting, besides telling us some information about the critical points for renormalized volume, is because we have the following parallel. Say that now I have some rational map of the Riemann sphere that is post-critically finite. And this. In a short sentence, what it means, you look at all the critical points, you look at the set of orbits, that set that I just mentioned has to be finite. For such a map, you can't define, by taking a push forward, a linear map between these sets. Here, this is the linear space of quadratic holomorphic differentials with a single pole. It's just some uh, finite uh, dimensional space. And you have the following map. And say that here you have uh, lambda and eigenvalue. So these are certain facts are known for this map. You should think about this map as the derivative of the skinning map. In general, all the angles are going to be less than or equal to 1. If f is a non latin map, again, I'm not going to define precisely what it is. I'm just going to name it. This is going to be a contraction. And in particular, if f comes for a quadratic polynomial, there is a result about expectra gap. All your eigenvalues need to be in absolute value between 1 over 8 and 1. So you should think that this map is in a way mirroring what's happening with the skinning map. This corresponds to uh, the condition for being a cylindrical. And why this whole is interesting? Because 
they still not know what I should put here for the, in order to have a spectral gap result for the skinning map. So the fact that this is already linked to renormalized volume tells us that if we cross our fingers, then maybe something will happen there. Uh, what is the, here. What's the source of the gap? Sorry? How do you prove that gap? Uh, that's a result of uh, both Epstein and Koch of less, came out last year. I'm not exactly knowledgeable about that, that, uh, that detail. I could tell you, I could say that the one over eight is in reality one over four D, where D, the degree of the polynomial that you take, uh, is that makes it a little bit more precise. Uh, well, now that we have some information that all critical points need to be local minimum, well, we can ask what is happening with the <coughs> infima. So this is solved in parallel by Bridgman, Brock, and Bromberg of last year that says the following. If we now fix M topologically, look at all this space of metric, the infima renormalized volume is precisely one half the simplicial volume of the double. So let me tell you what all the words means at this side. But the double of the manifold, remember that we had a compact object here. We take two copies of that, glue the boundary by the identity map. That's going to be now a compact manifold. If that compact manifold, manifold had a hyperbolic metric, I would just say here, hyperbolic volume. In general, that's not going to be quite the case. What's going to happen is that you're going to have some incompressible tori cutting along your manifold, where each part is going to be either finite volume hyperbolic, in which case you record this here and keep adding it, or it's going to be some fiber manifold for which we're not going to uh, add, up that, add up that volume. Why such a result will be expected? Because this is precisely the renormalized volume at the critical points. Uh, way to know this is as follows. Well, if this is actually the value that happens at the critical point, then you know that when you take a sequence of the infima, and then you're assuming you have to still not prove such result, you know that something needs to be breaking with the topology in M. Because if not, then we will know it will be this number here. There are basically three ways in which uh, when we take a sequence going to the infimum, the topology of M is going to break. One is going to be we could have a boundary curve here whose length is going to zero, which is going to create a rank one cut for us. We could also have a no boundary parallel curve whose length is going to zero, in which case we will drill a curve here and we will create a rank two cusp. Or we could have two curves in the boundary, and we could have a non-trivial cylinder for this. We can actually discard the cylindrical condition that both lengths are going to zero, in which case the whole cylinder is going to get cut. And then potentially you might have uh, many several components. So long story short, what is happening as you calculate the infimum of your renormalized volume is that's going to converge to the sum of renormalized volume of, of every single component. Uh, all those components need to be critical points because we were converging to the infimum, so we cannot do lower than that. And finally, observe that all the sets that we are cutting along when we double our manifold, all of them are going to be tori. So that's precisely the description of cutting along tori and calculating some hyperbolic volume I was telling you here. So that should give you some reason to believe that such a result as this uh, should be true. Uh, allow me to finish by posing a question, uh, by giving a question posed by uh, Maldacena that goes as follows. Take, say, a surface of genus 2, genus could be more than this, and take M to be a handle body. And by handle bodies, what I mean is that instead of just seeing this surface, as the boundary, you see it as the solid object that it is. And you can also take uh, the product of that surface with a real line. 
So now you can start comparing twice the renormalized volume of this versus the renormalized volume of this part. And the question is if this is always going to be true. Uh, the key point is that I only have, say, Riemann surface, so there is a marking that we are really forgetting here. So I should here take an nth over all structures that once I forget my marking, I obtain my favorite Riemann surface. Uh, I'm selecting separate to both of them. And any indication for why such a thing will be true is because, well, now thanks to this result, we know that this number is zero. And for certain examples, we do know this quantity is going to be negative. Also, if we were going to take this infimum, forgetting our favorite Riemann surface, and take over all possible structures, this number actually goes to minus infinity. Uh, so I will probably finish there.